All right, if you will, open up your Bibles to Psalm 24, the 24th Psalm. As Christy said, this is Palm Sunday, and we reflect ultimately on uh, this week where uh, is believed around this Passover time, and it's recorded for us in scriptures that uh, Jesus Christ made his way into Jerusalem on this day as he was heading towards that trial in which uh, the Jews put him on trial and which the Romans then proceeded to execute our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but he ultimately did that for you. He did that because there needed to be a payment uh, shed, there needed to be a covering for your sin. Our sin was too great. And the Lord all along, all the way back, even when he called out the people of Israel in Genesis chapter 12, he made a plan. Even further back, Genesis 3, if we remember when he was talking with Satan and when he was telling Satan that, yes, you're going to bruise his heel, but the Lord Jesus is going to crush your head. And so that's what ultimately happened uh, this week as we look back over 2,000 years ago when our Lord and Savior came into Jerusalem. That victory, uh, that victory walk. And we think, well, Jesus was crucified, but he was crucified for us. And he rose again. He conquered death. He conquered hell. He conquered the grave. And this was a victory walk, if you will. So think of that on this, this Palm Sunday. But we're not going to be speaking about Palm Sunday this morning. We're going to be uh, really combining all that with our Easter message next week and talk about this week and talk about the resurrection and talk about the crucifixion coming up this, this Friday for Good Friday. But this morning, I wanted to, to speak on, on Psalm 24 as we continue with our series in, in the Psalms. And again, remember, after the 25th Psalm, we're going to take just a short break and we're going to begin a series. And um, we have around 48 books coming uh, with the Begin series. So if you're interested in that, um, probably not next week, but the week after, we'll have some books out for you to follow through. And it's not quite a Sunday school curriculum. It's a little bit more involved than that, uh, but I think it's a tremendous study and I'm really looking forward to starting that with you and uh, we'll have those out for you to pick up. Not next week, not Easter, but the week after. Whenever we cover the 25th Psalm, uh, we'll have those books available uh, for you. It's uh, from Ken Ham and it's a series entitled Begin. So really looking forward to that. So Psalm 24 in our Bibles. Psalm 24. If we were to guess... Uh, why and when this psalm was written by the psalmist David. It says very clearly in the title, a psalm of David. Ultimately, we know about scripture being inspiration of God. God breathed out and mankind just merely wrote the words and God used men, as it says in First Peter. But uh, God used unique men, men like David, to write these psalms and used illustrations and examples from his own life to write these psalms. Why did he do that? Because David was just like you and I. David had skin and bone. David had a personality. David had a mind. David had a heart. David had a soul. We're all just like David. But yet God used David. David was a man after God's own heart. And God used David's life to illustrate for us on what to do that's right and what we should avoid that's wrong. And some believe that this psalm was written right around the time of when David was trying to get the ark from Obed-Edom. And we think, well, why is that? The, the, the vocabulary and everything surrounding it and just the way that it's, it's outlined, it just would make sense. Well, say, well, who is that guy? Uh, it's, the, the story is found in 1 Corinthians chapter, or 1 Chronicles 13, when David, he tries to bring up the ark of the covenant from Kiritath Jerem. Kiratiath Jerem. I think I'm saying that right. It's a Hebrew term, but you're like, where is that place? What's that all about? Well, in 1 Samuel, we know the story of the Philistines and how they conquered and how they, they grabbed the ark and they thought it was just something super special and they thought if they had the ark, then they could just destroy the Israelites. Well, that was the ark of God. That's where, where, where God was and it was a, a picture for the Israelites. And so ultimately judgment came upon the Philistines and they said, all right, we don't want any part of this ark. So they, they pushed it aside. They gave it uh, to, uh, and it was in the city of 
Kirtieth Jerum. Kirtieth Jerum. So back to Obed Edom. David then tries to send men to this city to reclaim from this city. And David's like, I'm so excited to get this ark back. We're so excited to have God back in Jerusalem, back in, in, in the city of David. Uh, and so he decides that he's going to get a brand new cart. He's going to get exactly what he thinks in the way that the Ark of the Covenant should be, should be uh, transported. However, that wasn't God's design. It wasn't God's plan. And leave it up to David to be a disobedient individual. And of course, that's a great example for us because sometimes we know what to do. David knew how to transport the Ark, but he said, I think my way, you know, I'm going to get a new cart. I'm going to do it this way because I think... God deserves all the glory, so I'm going to get a brand new cart. I don't want people to, to transport it. It's too great of a thing. And, well, the, uh, God says, no, this was my original design, and this is what I was, wanted you to do. This is how I wanted you to carry the ark. And David, again, thought he was, he was smart. And David thought, well, if I do it with a new cart, then maybe it will be okay. Well, it wasn't. Uh, he disobeyed God. And because of disobedience, a man by the name of Uzzah, uh, whenever the cart was going down the road and it, and it turned a little bit, and Uzzah, was, again, he was trying to do the right thing. And he's like, I can't let the ark of God fall over. So he reached out his hand to stabilize it. Well, just then, God struck him dead. Why? Again, because of disobedience. Uh, God's plan was this way, and mankind said, I think I know better, and they disobeyed, and that's ultimately what happened. So because of David's disobedience, a man by the name of Uzzah perished. Uh, David saw that and said, all right, God's serious about this. And so he, he put it in a, in a house, and his name was Obed-Edom, and it stayed there for three months. Following that, we, um, we know the story when David then does decide, okay, I'm going to do it the right way. And he goes and gets the priest, he goes and gets the staffs, he goes and, and puts it through, and they make one step, and we can hear the celebration of David. David celebrates and says, okay, we, we got through this first step. Uh, God is pleased. And they then proceed to take it to Jerusalem. And there around that same time, uh, David is celebrating, he's, he's dancing, he's carrying on, he's praising God, and his own wife looks out and says, this guy's nuts. This guy's crazy. And so the, the language that's here in Psalm 24 is, is very, has, a, has, has like celebration terms around it. David is worshiping. David is praising. So if we were to categorize this, perhaps, again, it's a mere speculation because, of, again, just the language around this psalm and how much David is celebrating, we, we tend to, to think that a psalm like this was written in a celebration of him obeying God and how pleased God is when we obey him. And that's a lesson that we can learn from the 24th psalm. So let's get right into this psalm. Uh, this Psalm 24, it's, it's divided into three parts. The first, it glorifies the one and true God. It sings of his universal dominion. David knew how great his God was and how perfect his God was and, and how dominant his God is. And the second part of this Psalm describes true Israel. It describes the ability that they have to communicate with him. And also the same, in retrospect, also allows us to have that same form of communication with our God. And the third, it pictures uh, the, the, the true redeemer. And here, the language here talks about gates. And, and uh, Jesus himself described himself as a door. I am the door. I, uh, if any man come to me and, and knock, I'll open and, and uses language like that. And so this psalm divided into th to three parts here. But let's begin first by looking at verses 1 and 2 of the 24th psalm. Let's read it. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he, that's God, has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Here describes the fullness of God's creation. It describes the foundation from which all things began. The world here was created out of nothing. You say, Pastor Jeremy, how, how do you explain that? How do you, how do you make any sense that there was nothing? You have a ball of nothing, and here's God Almighty creating. I cannot explain that. 
There's no science out there that it can explain how God created all this out of nothing. But the world was created. We believe that we take it by faith that our God, our sovereign God, our wonderful God, our, our all-powerful God created all this out of nothing. And it says here that the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. And we, we know that uh, it talks about how the prince and the power of the air, how that devil, that, that rotten creature who he's going around seeking him, whom he may devour and, and causing all kinds of chaos here temporarily. But that's just it. God will reclaim this world. And we know of that. We, we see that in, in the book of the Revelation. But here, let's focus on the fullness and the foundation of our God and the fullness and the foundation of his creation this world was created out of nothing. It was created by the very will of God. It says in Genesis 1.1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God willed for it to happen, and it just happened. It was created by the very word of God. And John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. That word is, is capital, the W there is capitalized, so it's speaking of our Lord Jesus. The logos is, is what it is. The, the word was God and the word was with God. And he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him. And without him, without Jesus, there was not anything made that was made. So this whole world, everything that we see here, was made by the word of God. Jesus Christ, he's the eternal word. He's the creator of all things. He was, he was evident. He was, he was involved in creation our Lord Jesus Christ. This fullness uh, in, in the earth, the Lord, and the fullness thereof, and the world, and those who dwell therein, they belong to God by the word of God, by the will of God, by the spirit of God. Genesis 1, 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. We can even see the Holy Spirit uh, involved in creation as well. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you say, how can you explain the Trinity to me? How, how in simple terms, how, is, how are they all equal? And that again, it, it takes faith to believe that, that they're all three, they're all one, and they're all equal with God. This world was created by the hand of God, not just by the Spirit, not just by the Son, but also by the hand of God. Hebrews 1.10, you, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. Our Creator God, the, the earth and how it's the Lord's and the fullness thereof, everything here belongs to God. And David is celebrating that. David is celebrating the fact that everything that is here, everything that I have, everything that I am, belongs to God. And I missed that the first time. Boy, my disobedience, it, it blocked that. And, and I, I, I forgot that everything belonged to God. And so when God instructed me to do it this way, I, I disobeyed. And I was judged for that. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And it, again, speaks of the wonderful creation of our God. Why was all this uh, done? Why, was, why did God create these things? Why did these things happen? And what's the purpose of it? In Psalm 19, we covered this a few weeks ago. But ultimately, God created all things for his glory. Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaim his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. He created for himself, created for his glory, as we looked at just a few weeks ago. So why is the earth the Lord's? Why is the fullness, why is everything here belong to him? Again, the purpose was for his glory. A second purpose was that the people that he created might worship and revere him. We'll look at this in much more detail when we get to verses 7 through 10. But... In Psalm 147, it says, He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. He created the people. He created the heavens. He created the stars to worship him, to proclaim his name, to uh, cry out to him. 
And then he created everything, the earth and the Lord's and the fullness thereof, for his possession and for his use. We observe this in Deuteronomy. It says, And behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heavens of heavens, the earth with it, all that is in it. It all belongs to God. In the New Testament, it says in Colossians, For by him were all things created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things, it says, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That very first statement of Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Why? What's the purpose? For his glory, that people might worship and revere him. And then thirdly, it's for his possession, it's for his use. We are God's instruments here. We're tools of him. And David understood that. David realized that I'm a, a mere tool. I need to be the one that obeys my maker. Again, we're just simple tools in the shed. Some of us are a little bit rusty and some of us were hanging up on the shelves and we think God can't use us. If you're not willing, God can't use you. But if you are willing, God will take that tool out and he'll sharpen you and he'll get you ready for his use because you belong to him. God wants to use you in a great and mighty way. But you have to let him. Just like if a sledgehammer was a, on the, on the, leaning up against the wall. And it's no good there. But if the maker comes over and he needs that sledgehammer. And he pulls at it. It's almost like, like Thor trying to get it up. And if the sledgehammer isn't allowing the maker to use him. Then the maker just says, well, no use trying to use that then. I'm going to put that to the side. I'm not going to try to use it anymore. And we can't be like that. We need to be tools that are ready, that are pliable, that are, that are for his use. Because the earth is the Lord's and everything here, it belongs to him. So let's be workable. Let's be ready to be used. Just like this past week is a great example. So many of our church rallied together. It was so encouraging. Uh, a few weeks ago after the second service, you know, we were trying to come up with details about the sportsman banquet. And I just simply asked, is there anybody that's willing to help? And we're just going to have a brief meeting. And there was probably 30 people here that showed up. And that was so encouraging to see. That was so great for the, ch for the church family to, to rally around and say, all right, we're, we're all in it, Pastor. We're ready to go. We're ready to work. Uh, we want to be used. And, and uh, all of you that, that helped all have a part in what happened last night. And when the gospel went out and, and the message was delivered and, and people were responding to that very message, all of you had a part in that because you say, well, all, all I did was this and that wasn't much, but all of you had a part. You were tools willing to be used and thank you for that. And so that's just one way that you can serve, but there's so many other ways that you can serve our Lord. The one who is, uh, th that the earth is the Lord's and that you belong to him. If you are a child of God, you belong to him. You're a tool ready to be used. So let's get pulled off that, that wall and let's be sharpened for his use because we belong to him. We belong to him. Let's look at verse number three of Psalm 24. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the Lord God of Jacob. So again, here, David is, is crying out, and who, who's going to be the one that can approach God? How can we approach God? Who is worthy enough to approach God? Our God and David is perhaps reflecting on whether it was the time with Obed Edom, whether he, he reflects on that time of disobedience, or whether it was another time early in his life. We're not exactly sure, but we know that he's reflecting how can I approach the one who is the creator being? How can I ascend to that hill, look to God, and speak to him? Who is even able to do that? Who can stand in his holy place to have access? to our God. 
Well, those are the same questions that we ask today. How can I come to know the Lord? How can I have access to God? How can I have the wealth that he proclaims? You know, it says in the New Testament that he has a cattle on a thousand hills. And, he's, and we always say, well, he's ready to slaughter one of those for you. Well, how can I have access to that? How can I claim that for myself? How can we have access ultimately is through the Lord Jesus Christ. What we're going to be looking at in more detail next week about the resurrection. Only those that accept that wonderful free gift of Jesus Christ can have that access to God. And you may say, well, I'm, I'm a believer. I know that I, I've trusted Christ and my Savior, but it, it, I don't feel like I have access to God like I should. Well, this here can help explain that. In verse 4, he who has a clean hands and a pure heart. That's another way, again, that step one, a believer in Jesus Christ, but also step two, to have access to God, you must have a pure heart. Only the pure in heart can have access to God, as it says here in, in uh, Psalm 24. Also in 1 John 3.21, it says this, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask and receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, again has access to God, and God in him, and by this we know that we, he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So only the pure in heart, only those that are in a relationship with God can have access to him. The wicked, they do not have access to God. And we know this by, uh, it says in Psalm 101, the 101st Psalm tells us this, Psalm 101 verse 7. It says, no one who practices deceit shall dwell in my house. No one who utters lies shall continue before my eyes. The wicked, they do not have access to God. They are not afforded that same opportunity that you and I are afforded to. Because God says here, if there's deceit, then they are not welcome in my house. The wicked, they do not have access to God. We can have access to God again. Like it says in, in the 24th Psalm. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul at, to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, that individual, verse 5, will receive blessing from the Lord. Will receive that blessing. So access to God through his son Jesus Christ. Access to God through a pure and holy heart. Access to God because of his grace. Psalm 21, verse 6 for you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad when the joy of your presence. God's wonderful grace. Believers also, like where we began, have access to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And a scripture to go along with this is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Justified meaning just as if I've never sinned. By faith, we have peace with God. That access with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So how do we have access? Through his son, Lord Jesus Christ. How do we have access? Through a pure and holy heart. How do we have access? Through his grace, through God's riches. They're so abundant. And we can claim that. And we can say, Lord, I can have access to you because uh, I have accepted your son, Jesus, as my own personal Savior. I know I've done that. But Lord, I also ask that you'll create in me a clean heart. Create in me, Lord, and, and help me to, to see the sin that's in my heart because I want to have access to you. But there's so much within me. And Lord, clean my heart up. Make it pure. Wash it. Wash it fully and wash it clean. And Lord, I want to receive that blessing that it says in verse 5. Lord, I, I want that, that righteousness from, from God. Lord, I want this generation, my generation, to seek him, to seek your face. Lord, but allow it to begin with me. 
allow it to begin with me so that I can have access to you and so that I can praise your name and I can ultimately worship. And that's what verses 7 through 10 proclaim. It's all about the worship. And we know, that, again, if we think of our illustration with Obed-Edom, as soon as they took that first step, worship happened. David proclaims and David praises God and says, God, thank you. Lord, you set out this plan, and Lord, I'm sorry for disobeying you the first time, but Lord, I'm going to get that right this time. I know I messed up, but Lord, here's, here's my heart, Lord. This is what I want to do, and Lord, help me to uh, be clean. Help me to be, be holy. Help me, Lord, to not mess this up. And, and again, when David made that first step, no judgment came, so he knew that God was pleased, and he was celebrating. And so let's pick that up in verse number 7 of Psalm 24. Psalm 24, verse 7, Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. David asks this question again, Who is this King of glory? And he describes it, The Lord of hosts, He is the king of glory. So in these verses, David is worshiping. David is praising God's very name. David is praising all of God's attributes. And that's what worship truly is. When we pause at the beginning of our services and when we sing and when um, we eventually close our, 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 we do this with the second service, we just started it, but we close with a, with, a, with a song of worship. When we pause our time in church and when we give him glory, what are we doing? What is the purpose of worship? Why should we worship his name? Why did David take some time out of this psalm to lift up and his voice and to give him praise and to give him worship? It's because he asked this very important question, who is the king of glory? And he answered it and says, the Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord that's mighty in battle. The Lord of hosts, he is the king of glory. See, worship is, uh, should be in accordance with God's commands. Worship should not be mechanical. It says in John 4.23, But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. And that's what David is doing. He's pausing and he's saying, Lord, I know who you are and I'm going to give you the praise. I'm asking this question, who is the king of glory? And David here is also answering that same question because he knows who he is. He knows about God's attributes and that's what we're doing when we worship. We're acknowledging God's commands. We're acknowledging his attributes. We're acknowledging that he is the king of glory. We are acknowledging that he is the one who has the fullness of of this earth. He is the one in charge of all things, and that's what worship is. Worship should give God the honor due to him. He deserves it. He is God. First Chronicles 16, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Worship uh, of mere human Devising is unacceptable. It says in Isaiah 29, what's, a, what's a, a false way to worship? It says, and the Lord said, because this people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. There's nothing at all with that sense of worship. If it's just mere lip service, if it's mere you're just moving your lips and, and you're not thinking about the, the words, or you're not thinking about the song, or if you're just worshiping Him in your car, and even if you don't have a song in your heart or a song in your head, if you're just saying, Lord, thank you. Lord, I, I know that you're a creator. I know that you've done all these things and you're just giving Him praise. You're giving Him worship. If you're just doing it with your lips and saying, oh, I, I should do this because I'm a, I'm a church person and I'm going to give him worship. And, but if you're doing it just with your lips, you're no better than the Israelites in, in Isaiah. That they're, they're drawing to God with their mouth, they're drawing with their lips. And it says, their hearts are so far from me. And that was a struggle with the nation of Israel. That they, they tried to do lip service, again, even into the New Testament, a few hundred years after Isaiah was written. 
The Pharisees, again, they were great with lip service. They were great making themselves look the part, look, making themselves look religious. And I'm sure that they were all tidied up and they just looked spectacular. And when they were walking down the streets, I'm sure everybody knew that they were Pharisees and that they were religious people. So they did great with their lips. But what did Jesus say? Pharisees, you're a bunch of whited sepulchers. You're a bunch of painted gravestones. You are full of dead man's bones. Then that's what, that's what the Lord is saying in, in Isaiah. That if we're just simply giving God lip service, if we're just giving God a part of us and not really thinking about and, and it hasn't made its way to the heart, that's unacceptable our worship and our praise. And again, it doesn't have to be through a song. David didn't always worship him. He's asking these very questions here. He's saying, who is the king of glory? And then he's answering, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And I'm sure that there's artists out there that could take this psalm and turn it into a song that we could sing. But, and David, we know that he was a talented musician, so I'm sure he probably even sang this before. But again, it, you say, well, I can't really carry a tune. I'm not really musical. Well, it doesn't have to be in music. You could just, again, give him praise and give him worship by reading this psalm or by just acknowledging, again, my God, he is a creator. My God, who is he? he he's a creator. He, he, this earth is his. Everything here, he founded it. He created it. And you're just giving him praise. Worship should be orderly and reverent. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. All things should be done decently and in order. Worship should be grounded in godly and obedient living. And we could continue with, with our, our, our talk of, of worship, but... Who is this king of glory? It's the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. David is pausing and he's reflecting on who God is. And he's giving him praise. He's giving him worship. And he is acknowledging who he is. And that is, again, the purpose of worship. So we think, what is this psalm all about? It's ultimately giving God credit for who he is. It's praising him. It's, it's worshiping him. When do we think this psalm was written? Uh, we're, again, we're just speculating, but uh, we're thinking of that time when, when David just gets over a victory from being a disobedient uh, individual to now being obedient. Okay, I'm going to follow after God. And so that happens, and he's just giving him praise. And, and if we've messed up before in our life, I know I have, and maybe you have as well, where you may say, well, I'm, I'm perfect like, like Aaron. Aaron's perfect, right? He's shaking his head. Say, well, I'm a perfect individual. I've never done anything wrong. Well, there's your first problem. You're acknowledging that you're perfect and you're not. So pride has crept in. So repent of that pride. And so we know that we're not perfect beings. We still have that sin-filled nature. You say, well, uh, I know that I'm a sinful individual. So how can I worship him? Well, David was as well. And so he provides a great example that even when we continuously, continuously mess up, there's a way for us to get back on track. And so that's what David did. He made it right. He went through and he followed God's commandment and says, I know that what I did before was wrong. I'm going to make that right. And I'm going to carry that ark the way that God told me I should carry it. And because of that, victory happened. That one step was taken and David's praising. Again, so much so that his own wife thought he was crazy and nuts. Now, my wife thinks I'm crazy and nuts all the time, but I also don't dance up and down the street. Well, maybe I do. I sometimes hop and skip and run down to the house from here. But, um, but we're all crazy in our own way, aren't we all? But David here, he's celebrating. He's celebrating the fact that he has been forgiven, that he's put away that disobedience and he's obeying. And so let's do that as well. Let's be tools that God can sharpen, that God can use. Let's be ones that acknowledge who God is, that he is the one that this earth belongs to him and everything here belongs to him. Let's ask this question, how can I approach God? Well, I can approach God through Jesus Christ and I can also approach God if I have a clean and pure heart, like verse four tells us. And then lastly, it's about worship. Lift up your heads, O gates. Open up those gates. Let the king of glory come in. Let him come in and, and fill your heart with gladness, fill your heart with joy, and worship and praise him. That's what the psalm is about. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the psalm. Thank you for a reminder 
to us that everything here belongs to you. We don't own anything. It all belongs to you. Lord, we give you praise for that. We give you all the glory. We give you all the thanks. And Lord, help us as we want to have access to you. Help us to be pure in heart. Help us to <clears throat> go to your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to ask you, Lord, for forgiveness. Lord, we are disobedient in this way, but we want to get off that track. We want to get back on the track of obedience. Help us, Lord, we pray. Dismiss us with your blessings. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all, and Lord willing, we'll see you all next week at, at the sunrise service at 7 a.m. or at the 1030 service next week. God bless.